Hello and welcome to Know Your Schools. I'm Mr. Williams, principal of Nutley High School. Today we're going to have our academic focus to provide a brief snapshot of all the great academic uh, programs going on here at Nutley High School. Uh, today with my co-host, Dante Vacaturo. Hi, Dante. How you doing, Mr. Williams? How are you? Always great. Here we are, midpoint of the year, Dante, and a lot of interesting developments going on in school. Absolutely. Course in Nutley High School is changing absolutely for the better. It all starts with the park test and the open grade book. Yeah, the park test is coming up. That's a big one, and uh, we'll be talking about that briefly. And then we have the open grade book coming on, which we discussed with the students in assemblies. Um, have you gone on and accessed the, the grade book? I have. I've been pleased with my scores, too, which isn't uh, too much of a bad thing. Uh, very easy to access. Very, gives a very comprehensive look at students' grades, teacher comments, and all that great stuff. It, it's a lot easier for adults to keep track of their students, mm -hmm. and it's a good way to keep in touch with your teachers to see how you're doing as the year progresses. Do you think it's going to change your approach to your classes at all, knowing the information you know now, or do you think you, you know, I know you're a great student, but I, I, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I think I still tackle tests the same way, still shoot for the highest score I could get. It's just that my parents would know if I got a low score the day after the test instead of waiting until the next progress report. So. You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> Absolutely. Good. Okay. Well, first up, Dante, we have uh, Ms. Persis Mehta, who's our district testing coordinator. We have her in the studio today to talk a little bit about um, park testing and give us an update uh, on this uh, huge undertaking that, that's going on across the state of New Jersey and in other states in the union. Yes. Welcome, right. Ms. Mehta. How are Thank you? Thank you. Thank you both for having me. Um, we felt it would be great just to talk a little bit about uh, what we've done at Nutley High School in sure. the last, really it's been uh, six months getting ready for uh, this, this huge undertaking. Why don't you give us a little a snapshot as to where we're at? Oh, it was well over six months actually. We actually participated in all seven schools in the <laughs> park pilot last spring. Um, and that was to better prepare us for the park testing that starts when we come back from break. So a lot of the preparation has been from a technology standpoint, <coughs> um, purchasing many Chromebooks and also putting wireless access points in just about every room in the building. And we're working on putting it in rooms all over the district. Uh, from a student's perspective, what does the park offer that the HESPA didn't? Because as we know, the, the park test is replacing the HESPA as our standardized test for the year. Correct. So the HESPA was previously just for 11th graders, and it was a one-time assessment, two days of English language arts, one day of mathematics. Um, now with the park, it's much more comprehensive and will give you a more comprehensive score report instead of just, you know, passing, failing, partially proficient, and so on. Um, it is a longer amount of testing days, but each one of the tests are shorter. In the early spring, we'll have uh, three days of English language arts, two days of mathematics, and in the late spring, we'll have two days of English language arts and two days of mathematics. And hopefully, and I've seen some preliminary score reports that the state has recently put out, it's much more comprehensive. I would actually say it's something more akin to the PSATs, where you get um, a breakdown in each category of your scores, and then also compares you um, to other students in the district, in the state, and nationally. So eventually, um, we know there's a kind of a three-year window um, in terms of how we're processing this. Correct. Um, and I guess, um, I think it's class of 2019 will be the one that, that def definitively needs it as a graduation requirement. Right. So currently the freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, it's sort of a transition requirement because it qu hasn't quite been standardized yet because this is the first time we're going to give it. So there will be multiple avenues to graduation, Park being one of those avenues to graduation. Um, but starting with the eighth grade class, Park will be the only um, requirement for graduation. Right, like there's always been in the state of New Jersey for the last similar to HESPA, many, correct. many years. Right, I did mm -hmm. state testing uh, for uh, quite some time. Well, thank you for your time today, Ms. Meta. Thank you both for having me. We really appreciate your efforts with getting us ready for this. And up next, we'll be talking to Ms. Davilio about the Instant Decision Day that uh, recently occurred here at Nully High School. And we are back with Know Your Schools. I'm Dante Vacator, always joined by Mr. Williams. And right now we will be talking about Instant Decision Day at Nutley High School, which recently occurred for the upcoming graduates. 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 <laughs> uh, as now, we are joined by Ms. Davilio, the head of guidance. Welcome. Thank you, Dante. Uh, right, now, right now, I'm a junior, and 
it's never too early to start looking about college, start thinking about college. So what would I need to do to prepare for something like Instant Decision Day? Well, right now the counselors are actually meeting with um, juniors and their parents uh, for their junior conferences. So this is something that the counselors will bring up to you. Um, and we have a typical list of colleges that tend to come. They're usually our local schools. Um, William Patterson, Felician College, NJIT, Seton Hall, Caldwell, Fairleigh Dickinson. We have a, a core group that come every year because they are local. So if any of those schools are on your list, um, you should inform your counselor that you would be interested in participating in something like Instant Decision Day. Um, as for how to prepare, it's really doing the research. Uh, following your junior conference, you can talk with your parents, you can use Navion to come back and visit your counselor, and you want to start looking at what schools offer, what you're looking for, um, and it really is a great opportunity to interview. So the more you know about the colleges and the programs that they offer and how they might fit you, uh, you can learn about it, uh, you know, store all that in your brain, and build upon that when you meet with the admissions officers because not only are they interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. So it's, it's great to be well-informed and understand what their programs are uh, so you can get some extra information from them. Absolutely. And Instant Decision Day recently took place in December, correct? Yes. Yeah. We, uh, we do our Instant Decision Day every year, the first Thursday after Thanksgiving. And um, the, the, the colleges know it, and they, they love coming here because they always give us great compliments. They always tell us that our students are well-prepared. They always dress very dapper like you are right now. Um, always they're always very polite. They're always you know, very well informed and they ask good questions. So they look forward to coming to Nutley High School. Um, this year we had 11 schools. We added um, a technical school this year for the first time because we wanted to make sure that we weren't just f focusing on students that were going to four-year colleges. So this year we included Eastwood Colleges. Um, so it great, gave a great opportunity for other students to get involved. We had over 100 students uh, participate. There were nearly 240 interviews. We had about 230 acceptances and students were offered scholarship money from only three of the schools. Other schools award it later on, but uh, the initial totals from three colleges were about $1.5 million. Wow. And most of those are renewable, so not that one student that was accepted to four colleges isn't going to accept all four scholarship applications, or scholarship offers, but over the course of four years, it's over <coughs> $6.3 million. So our students did very well uh, academically within the interviews, and then also you know, financially getting some nice awards. Great. And I just wanted to ask you, Mr. Stavillo, briefly about the, the whole early action process. I don't know if that's something you, you, you'd like to talk about. Well, the Instant Decision, decision Day is almost like early action. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two different types of decisions, actually three. Uh, there's the traditional, which either is rolling or a date that they give you, and it's a, dis a, date, a, a decision at a date that's posted like April 1st or something like that. Um, but Instant Decision Day almost acts like an early action because you apply early, you find out early, but there's no commitment to the school. Uh, er Early decision is different in that it's binding. Okay. Um, once you're committed, you're telling the school, if I get accepted, I'm going there. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, Instant Decision Day is like an early action type of uh, opportunity okay. for students. All right. Well, thank you for your time today. We appreciate the information. It's thank always you. a good thing going on with our guidance department. Up next, we'll be talking to Mr. D, uh, Mr. Dwyer uh, about the recent uh, mock trial uh, team's experience at the Essex County competition. A few years ago, I was approached by uh, two former uh, Nutley graduates who are currently lawyers working in, in Essex County uh, to uh, formulate a, a mock trial team uh, to co compete uh, at the uh, annual Essex County uh, Courthouse uh, competition. And uh, right now we have uh, the current members uh, of the team and the current advisors of the team. Mr. George Weyer is uh, uh, one of the advisors and Kara Joyce Skelly, uh, one of the students who was with it from the, the ground up, and we're here today to talk about uh, A, the program, and B, their recent experiences with it. So I guess uh, we'll start off with uh, Mr. Dwyer. Uh, Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, this year so far? So so far this year, uh, it, was a, it was a really great experience. The, uh, the students took the lead from the beginning. Uh, Kara Joy and uh, Phelan Yu were just so integral in making sure that the team was ready. Uh, they were practicing. They started practicing as early as the summer, uh, I, I think, and uh, even before they got back enrolled in school for the fall, uh, I, I just kind of was um, more of a device, 
I was kind of there to provide any support structurally that they needed, but uh, just about everything that needed to happen for preparation purposes was was done by Carjoy and Phelan, which was really awesome. And they're they're even kind of starting to turnkey that to a lot of their uh, the other team members to carry it on in the future. So this year they competed uh, in the uh, county competition. The uh, NJ State Bar Association runs it. Uh, they did a great job running it. Uh, they performed admirably in the competition. They, they won uh, the first round, went on to the second round, uh, went up against some stout competition, and, and just did, did a great job again. So re really proud of the way that they performed. Kara, uh, as a student, um, talk a little bit about what, what skill sets you're uh, being prepared for uh, as you enter a competition like this, uh, like a mock trial competition. Right, so when we're getting ready for mock trial, it's a lot of public speaking, um, understanding even the legal aspects of mock trial. The only um, law or things in the courtroom that is different is the rule of hearsay. Mm -hmm. Everything else is the same. You have to learn all the objections, all those the same, um, and all the procedures the same as you would in the real life courtroom. So a lot of that is really big learning curve for new members. Uh, even now, we're going to start teaching them uh, for next year, because mm -hmm. me and Phelan, who um, who have been really taking the lead on this now, we're graduating. So we're teaching the new uh, members how they can get ready for next year, because uh, each year alternates. We have a civil case and then a criminal case. So as that alternates, so does uh, the material of the case, uh, the different aspects in it that are involved. So different kinds of evidence. Uh, in a civil case, uh, you need uh, a um, different kinds of evidence than you would a criminal case. So that's really just been the learning curve for that and public speaking, knowing the law. And it really helps a lot of the members have be, have learned that they want to be lawyers mm -hmm. because of mock trial. Mm -hmm. And it, now they're kind of narrowing their focus on what kind of law they want to do. So aside from, and that's great that there's public speaking involved because I think a lot of students in this building need to really work on their public speaking, yeah. you know, in general. Because when you go into an interview or, mm -hmm. you know, when you get out of, of high school and into college, you need to project out and, and be yeah. a member of society. But in terms of writing and, and what other critical thinking skills would there, would there be involved in there? Yeah, I definitely, uh, the writing would be an important thing. Uh, when you're writing your opening and closing statements, there's a lot, there's a structure that's needed for mm -hmm. those, uh, those statements. In your opening, you want to kind of tell the story. You want to show, tell the jury really what happened. And uh, in the prosecution, you want to lay out the emotion involved in it. You kind of want, you want to persuade, it's like a persuasive, persuasive essay. Right. You want to persuade the jury. Yeah. Uh, in defense, in your opening statement, you want to lay out the facts. Mm -hmm. You want to show them this is what happened and don't get um, bombarded by what the pr prosecution saying and how it's all emotion. You know, look at the facts. Mm -hmm. And then you're closing, just tying everything they've heard together and really outlining it for the jury because it's the last thing they're going to hear. And you also really have to be quick on your feet because oh, yeah. you're, 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 you're being challenged Definitely. in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that especially when we were in our uh, the second round, we were going against I believe the school's Montclair, and they knew every single rule in the mock trial handbook, and it was really it was really intense. They cheated. <laughs> um, I think I got like every like three questions that I stated, I had an objection, and you really have to know the rule book because you can't always go back to your book and say, all right, what is that? What, what is that? You have to know right at the moment because you're also being timed. Mm -hmm. So you have that time constraint every single part of the process. What classes here with teachers have helped you get ready for that stage? Um, and not only think back from your freshman onwards. Freshman year. Well, I'd have to probably say it was my history classes. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Dwyer, Mr. Giorgio, they both have really helped me understanding um, our government and really the process of... Um, Different the court systems. Also, I think even this year helping a little bit was business, business law. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a really great experience from Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, even over the summer, I had an internship at Essex County Prosecutor's yeah. Office, and that opened my eyes to the everyday ins and outs of the office and really understanding what goes into it and all the little details that have to go into it. Every so day. you're planning on going to law or practice law, I would assume, yes. after you get out of Penn State. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, Penn State's the goal, yeah. um, yes. So what, what's your advice to an up-and-coming student entering Nutley High School next year or presently in Nutley High School if they want to take that same career trajectory? I would say take advantage of everything that you can. Take advantage of the teachers and the opportunities. Um, a lot of it is um, connections and knowing people. And through no forming a relationship with your teachers and different people in school, you get those opportunities. And also be bold. Don't be afraid to uh, really step out of your box and really uh, like look out to different career paths. And take advantage of mock trial, of course. Mm -hmm. Dante? 
Um, Sound advice? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, I definitely think that public speaking is a lost art, especially at our level, and it's great to see that somebody like you and somebody like Mr. Dwyer are teaching uh, public speaking and how to do it effectively and turning it into a, not necessarily a public speaking career path, but a career path nonetheless. <laughs> it's admirable, and it's great success that the Mock Trial uh, Club brings to Nutley High School. Yes, and I want to thank Mr. Dwyer for his support uh, for the students, and I want to thank Kara and Fallon, who's not here right now, but um, he's in Taiwan, I believe. Yes, he is. Um, for, for turnkeying it to the younger students, so hopefully we can keep uh, growing as a program. Thank you yes. guys for your time today. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you. Recently in our AP government classes, students had the ability to use Twitter to have an ongoing conversation over the State of the Union address, and in that light, we have the teacher for the AP government classes, Mr. DiGregorio, here with us. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Uh, why don't you explain a little bit how this uh, uh, assignment came to be? We first started doing it in the 2012 election. Uh, we used uh, an, an active live Twitter feed uh, during the Romney-Obama debates. And uh, we had pretty much full participancy in it, and it was, a, it was a great way to discuss what was going on in the debates while it was happening. Uh, and so we, had, we fired off lots and lots of tweets to each other. It was, it was really great to get everyone's opinions while it was actually happening. And from there, we extended it to Inauguration Day. And then uh, in, the, in, the, in the past couple of years, I've done it during the State of the Union Address, which is what we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, my question to you, uh, Mr. DiGregorio, uh, do you set up a protocol for the Twitter stuff? Because sometimes with that uh, social media uh, interchange, it can be a little it can be a little dicey sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, the first time we did it, I, I learned how to use Twitter about five minutes before the debate started <laughs> from one of my sons. Uh, but we did have to set in a protocol yeah. with the limitation of 140 characters. Right. Say what you need to say and, and, and move along, but obviously be respectful of, of people's opinions. Because in any democracy, people are going to be for something and against something. Right. And that's, that's really good, but you have to be respectful to everyone's opinions all the time, which is, it's, it's always been. Yeah, and it's that instantaneous reaction sometimes that gets people in trouble because they're not processing that Ab they have right there. Absolutely. And especially when you're trying to have the conversation with 40 students, uh, people are finding all things left and right, and you're trying to respond to them. And at the same time, it, it is an emotional thing. Yeah. So, somebody says something like, and it becomes something you might disagree with, but it can't become disagreeable. And it's, it's always gone very, very well. Um, so you started in 2012, and then in 2014 we had the State of the Union. Um, in terms of the feedback from the students, in terms of their perceptions of what's being discussed, what are you gathering as a teacher? What are they picking up on? Or, you know, is it a case of where they're just responding directly, or do you think they're, they're, they're giving you a good chance of being able to process the deeper issues? Well, yeah, that something like the State of the Union is forward thinking. Right. So what, what we do, and, and the students do this themselves, they don't need me, they're, they're pretty <coughs> self-aware of, of the issues that are germane today, whether it's foreign policy, economics, mm -hmm. something uh, the Supreme Court may or may not do. Uh, so there, and there's been an ongoing discussion in class. So now we're able to leave the classroom, and rather than say, watch this day of the union, and let's come in tomorrow to talk about it, we're talking about it as, as if we're all there together. Uh, and, and they they do an awfully darn good job of, of processing what's being said and anticipating it right. and then able to make some very good comments on it. So they're done Twittering. They've, they've, they've had their interaction. What's the next step for them after that, that State of the Union address? What do they do when they come into class next day? Well, when we finally sign off at the end of the speech, one of the things I always sign off with is, you know, we'll, we'll pick it up tomorrow. Yeah. So we follow it up the next day. And sometimes I'll make direct references to, to some of their tweets. Uh, for instance, this past year, uh, President Obama said something that I think most of the country thought was funny, but someone in our class did not. <laughs> uh, so so I, I, started, I, I started with that. Yeah. Um, so why didn't you think that was, that, that was funny? But uh, we'll ask them, I'll ask them about, you know, why did you say this? And, and you know, what was your thought process a little bit? But the, the good thing, though, is is because Twitter is only 140 characters, there's, there's a necessity for clarity. Mm. So it's things that aren't really all that ambiguous. But uh, we can pick up on, but because there is a limit of 140 characters, sometimes we need to continue our thoughts the next day. You know, we, we, you know, let's finish your thought here on foreign policy or the economy or anything that the president's gonna, gonna talk about. <clears throat> Do you see like the AP curriculum kind of expanding to, to deal with that social media aspect in a democracy? Because that, that is huge, a huge piece. 
I think it would be a great thing. Yeah. Because if you look at it, all the candidates tweet. Yeah. And everybody. Or they have somebody tweeting for them. Exactly. Right. And if you look during the State of the Union address, as the camera pans out to the to the to the members of Congress, they're all their thumbs are going 100 miles yeah. an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a very very real thing for us. Yeah. And it, it kind of ties into in our class with our use of the uh, of Schoology. Right. Because well, that's another form of social yep. media, maybe uh, maybe a a lot more academic than than, than Twitter, but certainly. Um, you know the technology is here to stay. Yeah. So it's I think it's got to be a very big part of uh, of technology. It's, it's changed our elections, and that's one other thing we talk about in class: the the, the influence of uh, of technology. Twenty years ago, no candidate ever had a web page. Or we go back to the nineteen sixty debates on TV. When, Absolutely. When that was like the first thing, and Nixon was sweating, but he Absolutely. actually won the debate. Yeah, yeah that's if, right. If you but listen, no, nobody, nobody was listening. Yep. Well, uh, Mr. DeGuerra, thank you for your time. We appreciate you using uh, the technology, and we're looking forward to hearing more uh, use of that and hopefully get that turnkey to other classes in the building. Thank you. During our recent, recent midterms, I had the opportunity to uh, help uh, score uh, a project-based uh, midterm um, out of the AP environmental course. Uh, with uh, Mr. Ken Banya, who's here today to talk ab uh, about um, his approach to uh, assessment in his class and how he kind of changed things up a little bit this year and what the implications of that may be uh, for us in our, in our building here. Welcome, Mr. Banya. Thank you. How are yeah. you? Good, how are you? Why don't you talk a little bit about what you did uh, with your AP Environmental Science midterm? Uh, well, throughout the year, we've been uh, embedding AP-type questions in every assessment along the way, every unit assessment. At the end, we're trying to give the students a feel for what the test might look like. Moving up to the midterm, um, being we did that, uh, didn't feel like it was necessary to do that again. Uh, so we came up with another learning experience that piggybacked off our last unit before the midterm, which was energy. Right. Um, and what, what we and, and this was taken from a college board release. So we we looked around and we found something that might apply to us, and we tweaked it to fit the needs of the class. Uh, so pretty much what we did is we. We were talking about energy, and we asked students to go home and, and look at 24 hours of energy use in their homes, um, look at certain aspects of, of how they use energy, what that would cost, <coughs> mm -hmm. what it turns out to carbon dioxide-wise, and, and do some calculations there, um, and work, work in pairs and find out which house out of those two might be a more eco-friendly home. Uh, from there, we asked students to devise a way to make it more eco-friendly moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was kind of two, twofold, um, and we devised a, a plan to uh, report out um, in a capstone type way and uh, we brought in some scores to take a look at it so we tried to outreach to the community as well to, to show what we're doing in the class. And Mr. Bain, you provided a rubric to the scores um, and what I liked about it, uh, we were talking before about public speaking. Uh, the students had to have that aspect of, of, of their delivery down which is important um, so I, I was very impressed with that. Uh, your thoughts or what was the reaction to the students, uh, Mr. Bain, when they, when they went through the process? I think, you know, going through the process, you know, we're dealing with things like watts and, and pounds of carbon dioxide and where our energy comes from here in New Jersey. I, I think the students can appreciate and understand maybe a deeper meaning of that, having to go through the calculations themselves, having to look up and, and figure out where our energy exactly comes from and how, how to relate that to, to their own personal lives. I think that's the big take home is when they could bring it back home, literally, yeah. and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, try and try and uh, make make uh, judgments on it or make make plans moving forward based on what they found. So applying their applying learning. Applying what they learned. Sure, yeah, that's, sure, that's sure. very important. Dante, as a student, how do you feel about that if you were given the opportunity to apply what you were learning in class as whether as opposed to just taking a paper and pencil test? I think it's great. I think it's it definitely keeps the student's interest if it's more of a project based test and it's less of, oh, here's a hundred multiple choice questions, get them right. right. I think it allows the students to use their knowledge a little more creatively and mm -hmm. a little more diversely. Uh, and yeah, I, I would love to have that instead of my 36 question AP Physics midterm, <laughs> so. Well, Mr. Bain and I were talking about that, about yeah. how we are looking to move instruction to that piece. Yeah. You know, to be fair, it, it's easier in some courses more than others, sure. and we right. are, we are starting down this road of, of I'm really experimenting with it myself, is, is how to make this um, fruitful, how to make it useful for students, um, where we can you know, continue the learning just a different way. You know, that's, that's really what we're doing. Right. Yeah. And just to, to put a, a, a bow on this discussion, we talked about PARC before at the beginning of the program. Um, a lot of what PARC does, or will ask students to do, will be to think critically in kind of a, a structured, uh, problem-based uh, environment. So I think the more we kind of shift that way, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing if kids are, are going to be taking their information and using it as opposed to just regurgitating it. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you for your time today, Coach. Thank you. Thank you.
Great job. And to my co-host, Dante, I say, as always, thank you very much and have a good winter break.